Uh, children ages four through kindergarten, you are dismissed to Children's Church at this time with Miss Becky in the back. And the rest of you, if you would turn to 1 Timothy chapter 2, that's where we're going to be today. Now, I'm gonna, as you're turning there, I'm going to tell you a little story. Um, this year has been a, a big year for the Southern Baptist Convention, the SBC. If you're familiar with them, uh, you know, you've probably seen them in the news over the last several years because there's been a few um, scandals here and there, some poor leadership decisions and whatnot. But lately they've been trying to uh, do what they can to put Scripture back at the center of how they operate uh, in their churches. And the big news this year that, that made the news, it was all over online, it was all over on Fox News and CNN and MSNBC and all these different things, is that the SBC chose to excommunicate some of the churches from their roster. I think there were, um, I think there might have been three for this particular reason. Saddleback Church was one of them. Saddleback is a huge church out of, I believe, California. Um, it is, Saddleback is one of the biggest churches in the United States. It was at least formerly led by Rick Warren. Rick Warren has become a household Christian name mainly because of the books that he's written. Um, the Purpose Driven Life, The Purpose Driven Church, those are two of his books. Uh, and he's also been a, a very loud and boisterous voice uh, in opposition of the SBC's recent decision to excommunicate some churches, Saddleback being one of those churches that was excommunicated. And they were excommunicated for the fact that they were ordaining women as pastors and understand that the SBC does have a document called the Baptist Faith and Mission, which details a lot of their doctrinal distinctives. And, and part of that is how men and women relate to one another in the church and how they function within the church. And they recently decided they need to make that a a, uh, a prerequisite for churches who want to be in friendly cooperation with the SBC. And they addressed those that were not in friendly cooperation with the SBC. And ultimately, uh, I think it was about a 90% vote of all the, the delegates that were there voted to oust these particular churches. Now, many of the secular news outlets, uh, they got a hold of this story and, and they deemed the decision misogynistic and archaic and, and unbiblical. Uh, and I know that, that we have a lot of different views in this very room on, on how men and women should function in the church. I know that there are some in this room who would say that, that women absolutely may be pastors and may be overseers and elders. There are some in this room that are firmly against it. And so in the wake of this big decision from the SBC and in kind of following up with uh, the, the mini-series that we've been in, uh, talking about complementarianism in the garden and in the home, I thought, well, why not just finish this mini-series up with complementarianism in the church. And I, I defined complementarianism last week and a few weeks ago, but I'll give you just a, a brief description of what it is again. Complementarianism is basically a doctrine that states that men and women are 100% created equal in dignity. They are each created in the image of God, but they are created for different roles, distinct roles in this life. And so we're going to be looking at that specifically at what God's word says about complementarianism in the church, how it ties back to the Garden of Eden, Genesis chapter 2, when everything was still very good and God's orderly design had yet to be upset by sin. And the truth is that understanding what the Bible teaches on men and women in the church is is really key for the life and the function of the church. It is an important thing. God has given us a pattern for the flourishing of his people. And if there's any place in this messed up, broken world for God's good and, and desired order to shine through, it ought to be among his gathered people. And so we should seek to understand this as best we can. We're going to be in 1 Timothy chapter 2, and we're going to start with verse 11, which, which in, in the way it reads in the English is going to seem really crass, really um, almost unfortunate, almost really uncomfortable to read and, and to study. But I want you to stick with me and see that the way it's written in the English is not the way it's intended to read in its original language. And so if you would turn to 1 Timothy chapter 2, we'll cover verses 11 through 15, and then we're going we're gonna to go further on after that. I'll briefly cover uh, going into chapter 3, uh, looking at the overseers, verses 1 through 7, and then deacons, verses 8 through, I believe, 13. But here's what God's Word says right off the bat here. 
Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Yet she will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. Now, we're going to stop there and let's just be real. That's a little bit uncomfortable to read. Is I mean, I'm feeling tension up here already. I know you're feeling a little bit of tension out there. And this really is... It's an easy passage for us to want to just explain away. Some people would say that, that Paul is kind of setting up like a He-Man Woman Haters Club type thing here, and that's not what this is meant to be by any means. And let me once ag again address some of the biggest uh, arguments against this passage. There is a belief that Paul is writing these things to Timothy because Timothy, young Timothy, is pastoring the church in Ephesus. And Ephesus, some believe, stood as this bastion for, for feminist supremacy in religion. And they had this temple that was dedicated to the Greek goddess Artemis. The Romans knew her as Diana. And some believe that this, this temple was a symbol of, of empowerment and, and feminism. And so they were saying that, that what Paul is writing is limited only to the issues that are going on in Ephesus. However, most historians and most biblical, biblical scholars would look at this, would look at the history of Ephesus and say that the feminist Ephesus never existed. It was like any other Roman province known to man at that time. The, all the magistrates during that time were men. The pagan cult hierarchy was controlled by men. And so this argument that Paul's teaching uh, is just for Ephesus it, because of that reason is null and void. And again, just as last week's text had opposition, this week's text is often met with the, you know, that was then, this is now argument. So there's the, the argument that, that, well, it's for a particular location, and then there's the argument, well, it's for a particular time, not for our time. And again, there's nowhere here that suggests that what Paul is saying should stay in Ephesus in that time, that it's meant to be left there. And that's where we get into something that I think is, is fairly important for us to, to discuss, cultural expression versus central revelation. There is a difference in these two things. Cultural expression is essentially when Paul would write something uh, almost as a, um, a very particular example of an overarching principle that doesn't change. So cultural expression, the examples given, it may change. Those examples may change throughout time, throughout culture, but the principle given, which would be the central revelation, does not change. And we have a really good example of that just you know, a couple verses before what we just read, where Paul says that it's best for women to dress modestly and to adorn themselves, th themselves with, with good works. Um, Paul gives a couple of ex examples in there. So that, that dress modestly and adorn yourself in good works, that's a non-changing principle. That's central revelation. But the way he expresses those things can change, where he says, um, you know, don't braid your hair. Women don't braid your hair. And, and the reason he says that to them is because in that time, braiding your hair was a sign of, of promiscuity. Today, it's really not. So that's a cultural thing that may change, but the principle does not change. And that's what we're looking at here. We're looking, I believe, at central revelation, not at cultural expression. And I want us to see that because when we go to uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 and 15, Paul says, I am writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God. And so the only limitation that we see Paul put onto this teaching is that which is within the church, the household of God. And when he says the household of God, he means the family of God. The church of the living God is his gathered people. And so this teaching isn't to be limited to Ephesus at this time or even to the first century. It's limited to his eternal church. It is the central revelation, not a cultural expression. So within the church, among the gathered people of God, this is how things ought to be, is what Paul is saying. 
And Paul's application for these things that we're covering today are God's prescription for his church, unchanging, again, regardless of time and location. And so let's get into it. Let's look at what Paul is saying here. He's got two prohibitions, essentially, that he's teaching on. Paul says, let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. And we look at these words and we picture that what Paul meant was something like women, you can show up to church, keep your heads down, don't make eye contact, you can't say a word, right? Like that's just kind of the feeling that we get when we read this. And I know as we read this in the English language, again, it seems a little bit crass. And truth be told, it is this passage, this very passage that is used and abused more often than any other text when it comes to women in the church, some churches today, they do not let women serve in any capacity whatsoever in the church based on this passage. Some churches have gone so far as to say that, that women ultimately, you can only, all you can do is show up. Don't speak at all. They may not read scripture. Women may not pray. They may not sing. No woman could stand up and, and give an announcement during church. That's, that's how people would, some churches, apply this. I, I was listening to a sermon yesterday from a gentleman who looked at the women in his own congregation. And he says, women, your job is to sit there, nod your heads, and look cute. I thought, why does this man have a job? Why is he pastoring over a whole church? Because that is so not the message that is given here. I know of an entire denomination that will not even allow women to become members of their church because if they become a member, that makes them able to vote in the church. And if they vote in the church, that means they get to exercise some amount of congregational authority over men in the church. And I want to be clear with you these are all abuses of 1 Timothy chapter 2. These are all abuses. This is not how God intends his church to be. This is not at all the heart of Paul's directive here either. We should know that Paul's heart is not to say that women must keep their mouths closed. And so let's look at the actual language here. That The Greek that Paul uses for quiet is hesukia, which means a, a stillness. Paul's asking for stillness, a calmness for the believer. Hesukia is used of the God-produced calm, which includes an inner tranquility that supports appropriate action. And this is exactly why, when we look at the original language, when we look at the text, this is exactly why we don't just take a verse and isolate it and say this must be what it means. We have to look at some of Paul's other teachings. And if we do, if, if you were to do an in-depth study of 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and 1 Corinthians chapter 14, you would see that silence is not an absolute command for women that encompasses every element of the worship service. There are many different kinds of speaking ministries that take place in the church. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians, women can prophesy. They had, they had women prophesying during the service. He had no problem with that. Go for it, women prophesy. They could evangelize, they could read, they could pray. Paul did not treat all of these speaking ministries identical here. And if we look at the context of our passage today, we see that it's, it's, it's not about all speaking and all speaking ministries, it's about learning and teaching. That is the context of what Paul is saying. Teaching was the only thing, the only speaking ministry in corporate worship that Paul prohibits women from doing. So in the context of that, corporate worship, women are not to be teachers but are to be learners is what Paul is saying. And here's how we can know that that's what Paul means. We need to see that next sentence that says, I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. And so we look at that and we see that the call for a woman to, to remain quiet or in a better English term, to exhibit stillness in the church starts in verse 11, it ends in verse 12, and it bookends this, this unit, basically. And within that unit, specifically, he's talking about teaching and exercising authority over men. And over men, I think, is an important clarification that needs to be made here, that Paul makes, I should say. It applies both to teaching and to authority. And so the two prohibitions that Paul is giving right here in this text is that women 
should not be public teachers over men and that women should not exercise authority over men. And now after Paul states this central revelation, let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness, and then he further explains it saying, with these two prohibitions, I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Paul now backs up that prohibition, those prohibitions, with two reasons. The text says, for Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. And so reason number one that we see here, the, the first reason that Paul gives for these prohibitions is, is the order of creation. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. That's what, that's what Paul says. And we covered this a little bit last week. We covered it three weeks ago. I don't think I need to go in depth here, but Adam was formed first in, uh, outside the Garden of Eden, and then Eve was, Eve was formed inside the Garden of Eden. Man and then woman. And as far as the order of creation goes, it indicates Adam's position as the one who names and the one who protects. And that protection has a spiritual aspect that comes with it. We saw that, that Adam was the one given the word of command, do not eat of this tree. Adam was the one that was given that, and he was to communicate that and implement it and enforce that, enforce that moral boundary that was given by God. And the creation order, aside from God's explicit say-so, indicates Eve's position as the one who helps and supports. The, the Hebrew was, was Ezer Konegdo, if you remember that term. She's the Ezer Konegdo in Genesis 2, a helper fit for the man, which is a huge term, a beautiful term. And so reason number one is the order of creation. Reason number two is that Eve was deceived. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. I think that there are a couple different ways to interpret this, and I'm just going to share with you what I believe to be the, the correct interpretation, just to save a little time. I think that Paul is making a statement about what happens when the roles of men and women are reversed. There's another interpretation that states that this is about the nature of women being more easily deceived than men, but I think when we look through Scripture and Paul calls out false teachers and, and people who are going with unsound doctrine, he lists off men's names. You never see, a, at least I can't think of a woman's name in which he mentions there. So I don't think women are any more prone to deception than men are. And so I believe that Paul is making a statement about what happens when the roles of men and women are reversed. Adam was supposed to be the head who was responsible for leading and responsible for directing. But he abandoned his role, he abdicated his role, and Eve took over and led Adam into sin. And there was this role reversal that took place because of this, in, in this, and sin was a result of that particular role reversal. Amen. And the takeaway here, the takeaway is that there are two guilty parties. Adam sinned openly. Adam sinned openly, but Eve was deceived, and Adam followed Eve, Amen. and that's what we see. And in highlighting this, I think Paul may be grounding his, his prohibitions in the church in God's design for men and for women, which was displaced in the fall. And I like this interpretation of this text, particularly because it points back to the created order, and it leads us toward, again, God's original design. Paul does not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man because to do so would be a violation of God's original design for men and for women in the created order where man was given headship and the woman was given as helper and the reversal of those roles thousands of years ago proved to be catastrophic. Another reason I favor this interpretation is because I believe this verse is embracing God's design, and I think that we see that again in the next verse. We see a, a, an overall context here of God's design. The next verse, which is tricky to, to interpret, says, Yet she will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. And I want you to try to follow me closely on this because, again, I think this is, this is tough, but it's important. Um, I used to think that this particular verse was about Jesus, 
I thought that this was a call back to Genesis 3.15 where uh, there's a prophecy that the seed that comes from the woman will crush Satan. You know, that seed is Jesus born into this world. And so the woman and, and ultimately everyone else will be saved through the birth of Jesus, which I believe is good and, and true, but I don't think that that is Paul's meaning here exactly. I think the word saved here is not about giving your life necessarily to Jesus and, and getting saved. I think that's a part of it. And I know that there are s several applications in the New Testament that that is exactly what saved means, means to be justified. But there are several areas in the New Testament where saved is not just justified, but also sanctified and refers to something continual. There is a broader scope of salvation that covers the entire life of the Christian, not just a single definitive moment of repentance and, and faith leading to our justification. And for example, you could look at Philippians 2.12 that says to believers, Paul is writing to believers, as you have always obeyed, so now work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And I think what's happening here is Paul is connecting saved continual obedience to salvation. There's a concept of continual obedience within salvation, which would make sense with our text this morning when we look at it. If they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. So saved, I believe, is relating to obedience, and that relates to childbearing in this way. Childbearing is one of the ways in which a woman demonstrates her obedience to the God-given design. DeYoung, Kevin DeYoung, one of my favorite pastors, he puts it this way. Instead of casting off all order and decency, a godly woman embraces her true femininity in dressing modestly, learning quietly, bearing children, and continuing in faith, love, and holiness. And he says, understandably, some women will not have children because of medical reasons or due to singleness, but insofar as it is possible... Childbearing is one of the unique ways in which a woman can accept in obedience her God-given design. And here's how it all connects, I believe. Ultimately, Paul is relating the prohibition of women preaching over men and exercising authority over men to God's original design and is encouraging women to embrace that design. God does not want the same role reversal from Eden to take place in his church. Amen. And now I want to address something else with you as well. Paul may be saying that women are not to teach publicly over men or to, uh, to exercise authority over men in the church, but he's also not saying that just any man can do that either. He's saying that there must be qualified men qualified men to do such things. Being a man is not the only prerequis prerequisite to, to teaching in the church and, and leading the church spiritually. When we go to 1 Timothy chapter 3, Paul begins to write about two distinct offices, specifically overseers and deacons. And, and let's, let's look at overseers. These are the texts that I'm going to go through fairly quickly. I'm not going to explain each and every qualification. I just want to pause on a couple of points here. There are three Greek words used in the New Testament to describe spiritual leaders in the church. And all three of these words are found together in Acts chapter 20. But the words are episkopos, which is overseer, presbyteros, which is elder or, or presbyter, we would use the term elder, and poimen, which is pastor. And all three of these words, overseer, elder, pastor, they all refer to the same office. They're all the same office. And in Acts chapter 20, Paul calls the elders of the Ephesian church, he calls the elders, presbyteros is what he says, to watch over the flock as overseers, episkopos, and to care for or pastor, poimen, the church. And we need to move this through this fairly quickly here, but in 1 Timothy, Paul reveals two unique functions given to these overseers. Two unique functions given to them, teaching and ruling. He gives them those two main jobs, the very two things that Paul prohibits women from doing, therefore, therefore, prohibiting women from holding this office of overseer and pastor. And in 1 Timothy 3, 
When we look at the text, it says, if anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, and able to teach. Able to teach. And then there's several more qualifications after that, but right there, look at that, able to teach. Ultimately, overseers carry out the ministry of the word in the church which according to Paul is, is not something that women are to be doing over men, which is exactly why I think Paul is very explicit in his pronouns that he uses here. He aspires to a noble task. He must be the husband of one wife. He must manage his household. He must not be a recent convert. He must be well thought of by outsiders. And let me throw this out there. Teaching does not have to mean leading a, a Sunday school class or a small group or, or preaching a sermon, though I do think that those are important things, fine things for the overseers to be involved in. And in fact, we do this, this coming ministry year have overseers who will be leading Sunday school classes and small groups, which I think is incredibly encouraging. But what this tip technically does mean, able to teach, is that overseers must know their Bible they must understand theology and that they can discern truth from error and know how to communicate that to others. That is so important. Paul put it this way to Titus. When he wrote to Titus, he said this, he must hold firm, the overseer must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. And that is supremely, supremely important. Overseers are ultimately responsible for the theology that is taught within the church. And when someone teaches something out of sync with Scripture, the overseers have a responsibility to deal with that, to deal with it quickly, swiftly. And then we could go to 1 Timothy 5, I think it's 17, which mentions elders and overseers and pastors again as those who rule well being considered worthy of double honor. And so we see that overseers are to carry out authority in the church. Let overseers who rule well, to have authority over the discipline of church members, to have authority in the doctrine that is being taught in the church, and the authority to be the, the sole interpreters of that text for the church, to have authority in stewardship matters and in spiritual matters within the church, within the flock. And now listen, I know that there is this major movement in the American church that pushes for women as pastors and women as elders, and I know that that's considered, considered normal and, and fine at this point. In fact, um, in this very community, I will tell you that I or we, even as a church, have been labeled ancient and outdated and, and a number of other things because of our stance on on female pastors, and I've had the argument made to me, you know, what does it matter as long as Jesus is being glorified? And my response to that typically is it matters. It matters because Jesus is most glorified when we hold to the order set forth for his bride by the Father. When you look at biblical history, you see that God has always established men as, as leaders, spiritual leaders. And, and yes, some of them have been good. Some of them have been horrible. And that's not God's failing. That's man's failing. And some of the good ones, the, the men weren't even that good. They had incredible women who were influencing them toward good. But, but we see man as spiritual leader in Genesis chapter 2. From start to finish, the leaders among God's people in the Old Testament were men. The priests were men. And you could argue that that's just Old Testament culture. But then let's look at Jesus and let's look at the New Testament. Out of a cultural backdrop that erased the dignity of women and treated them as property, Jesus affirmed their worth and he benefited from their ministry. He broke these cultural taboos of, of speaking freely to women in public. He addressed women tenderly as daughters of Abraham, which put them on the same spiritual plane as men. That was unheard of in that time. He ministered to the needs of women and he allowed women to minister to his needs as well by anointing him and serving him and financially supporting him and his disciples. And we find that in Luke chapter 8. Amen. 
Some offered him hospitality. Many women mentioned by name in the Gospels were among his disciples, and some of these women were the first people to witness the resurrected Jesus. He chose to appear to them before anybody else. Jesus' teaching on divorce asserts a woman's personhood rather than treating her as property. His teaching on lust protected women from being treated as nothing more than objects of a man's desire. Just Jesus also made it a point to teach women during a time in which women were not to be sitting at the feet of a rabbi and learning anything. Jesus honored and valued and respected and benefited from, and he included women in his ministry in very powerful ways. But I want you to hear this. Jesus' attitude toward women stopped short of including them in spheres of responsibility that were designed for men. Amen. He never made a woman an apostle. He never gave a woman permission to... to uh, to preach over a man, he kept with the creation pattern. And Jesus, Jesus broke all those other social taboos. He had no problem breaking down those man-made divisions between man and woman, restoring di dignity and worth to women, but he never stepped outside of God's Genesis 2 design because then he would be contradicting himself. God's design is for qualified men to lead churches, to teach the word, and to exercise authority. God's design calls men as pastors and elders and overseers. Enter office number two, which is the office of deacons. We find Paul's teaching on deacons in 1 Timothy 3, 8 through 13. And there are qualifications and there are responsibilities listed here, but none about teaching and none about ruling. Rather, deacons serve and they strengthen the church. That is their role. The Greek word for deacon is diakonos, and it means servant. They serve the church in ways that do not include authority or, or preaching on a Sunday morning. If overseers are to minister in the word, deacons are to minister in deed, essentially. And here's where things get, I think, just a little bit sticky and, and where, you know, maybe some of us start to disagree just a little bit more. But I believe that this office of deacon here in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 8 through 13, I believe that this is an office meant for both men and women. Amen. Some would say that deacons may be only men. That, that's my favorite pastors that I listen to would, would say that that's their interpretation as well. And I'm okay with it if, if you say that, but I believe and, and we practice as a church uh, the role of deacon and deaconess, men and women together serving in this role. And again, the interpretation is tricky, but I do believe it is there. In verse 11, after going through qualifications for deacons, Paul says their wives likewise must be dignified, not slanders, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. And the word for wives here is the same word for women. The word is, is uh, gynecus. Gunacus. And it is not a term that differentiates between wives and women, but it is used more often for women than it is wives in the New Testament. And I believe the correct interpretation of 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 11 here would refer to female counterparts to male deacons, or deaconesses as we would call them, rather than actual wives of deacons. And Paul, I mean, if you think about it, Paul does not... Paul does not give qualifications for overseer wives. He never gave a qualification for an overseer wife. Why in the world would he, would he make these qualifications for deacon wives? It just doesn't make sense. So I believe that Paul is referring not to their wives, but to the women who, who are also in that office, who hold that office. What we are seeing here in 1 Timothy 3.11 is an office of the church that both qualified men and qualified women can serve in. Once again, I think that we shouldn't isolate this passage. Is there anywhere else in Scripture that talks about women serving as deacons? And I think the most common one is Romans 16, where Paul is writing to the Romans and he says, here's Phoebe a servant of the Lord, a deacon of the Lord is the word that he uses. And he commends her for her service. He doesn't say, hey, you shouldn't be serving here. He says, receive her. Here at Grandview, 
our overseers are all, and, and our pastors are all men. Our deacons are both men and women, and those deacon teams are essentially uh, divvied out into our ministry teams. Grandview's ministry teams are our, our deacons and our deaconesses. And we have many ministry teams here at Grandview. We have the facilities team and the discipleship team and worship and nurture and missions and outreach. And wouldn't you know it, we are split right down the middle on them. Nine men and nine women who serve in these official roles in our church. And I believe that we are blessed to have them. And I believe that we are within the biblical bounds of God's design in having women serve in these roles. And I want to offer a final word on this. I want to spell out just a little bit um, what I think men and women should be doing in the church. And before I get to the men, women, I just I, I want to say this to you. You are essential and indispensable to the health and to the life and to the ministry of the church. And your ministry is not rooted in any kind of pragmatism or just what works best for us. Your ministry is rooted in what Christ has made you by dying for you and raising from, from the dead for you. He has made you disciples. He has made you witnesses and fellow workers. That is what your role is rooted in in the church. Women can minister to the physical needs of church members. Women can make disciples and should make disciples. I think it's so dumb for churches to say that women shouldn't evangelize, that women shouldn't be discipling anybody. I mean, Jesus called his whole church to be disciples who make disciples. And I just want to see something. I want, to, I want you to raise your hand if you are a believer in Jesus Christ. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, put your hand in the air. Awesome. Most of you have your hands in the air. Now, I want you to keep your hands in the air if a woman in your life was at least partially responsible for the fact that you are a believer in Jesus Christ. Look at that. Look at that. Almost everybody kept their hands up, right? A mother or a grandmother, as, as we have with Timothy here. Timothy learned from his mother and grandmother or a Sunday school teacher or a friend or a sister. All those hands. It's so cool to be up here as your pastor and look at that. All those hands. It would be so, it would be to our detriment if we said that women cannot evangelize and that women cannot be disciple makers in the church. How dumb. Women can mentor. Paul, calls, er, Paul tells Titus that women are to teach what is good and to train the young women to love their husbands and to love their children and to be self-controlled and pure and kind and favorable to their household and submissive that the word of God may not be reviled. Women can counsel. They can pray. They can serve on committees in the church. They can come alongside overseers in difficult situations that involve other women. They can minister to single moms. Women can minister well to new moms in ways that men cannot do. They can lead women's Bible studies. They can teach theology to other women. They can plan mission trips. They can read scripture in a church service. They can lead us in song during the worship service. They can pray during the worship service. They can usher, they can greet. There are only two things that Paul says they should not do in the worship service. Teach over men and have authority over men. But there are 10,000 things that women can be doing in ministry here. And as your pastor, it is my joy to, to make that point abundantly clear to you. Amen. And as your pastor, I, I got to say that I think the women, I think the women in our church step up in some of the most incredible ways. I am proud of the women in Grandview Baptist Church. In my six years of being here, I have served alongside uh, some of the most godly, capable, and gifted complementarian and women that I've ever known, and I have benefited from them. I've benefited greatly from your ministry, ladies, and so sincerely I say thank you. And church, if I can put an emphasis on this, I don't want this message to be so much about what women cannot do, but what men must do. The statistics are, are clear. Women in the church are, in general, more interested in reading their Bibles. They're more interested in growing in their faith. Women in the church are more interested in serving the church. And I'm sure that many times we see in churches where women are, are venturing into service areas that are reserved for men, it is probably because men have abandoned that role in that church. And so I'll say for starters, the office of overseer is reserved for capable and qualified men. Not every man should be an overseer, though. That much is clear. Uh, 
But the clear teaching on overseers, elders, pastors is that these are positions for men to fill. And I am thankful for our, our six overseers that we have and for our four mentee members that we have that we're training up to be overseers as well. And on top of that, just as women may serve the church as in that deacon role, as we typically refer to them more as deaconesses, uh, men should seek to fill that position as well. Men, I'm going to tell you that there are little boys who need to see men serving in the church. Amen. They need their dads. They need mentors to show them what loving service to the church looks like, or we're going to have another generation of, of male idleness in the church. We have such a desire in this church for, for some of the older boys in our Sunday school classes and in, in, in contenders children's ministry to see men teaching. And so men, if you desire to fill that role, uh, I ask you to, to seriously consider stepping up into that. Come talk to me. Come talk to an overseer. Men, other men need you to serve in the church, to be influenced by their brothers in Christ and to share the load so that the men who are serving don't get burnt out on serving too much. Men, your wives need to see you serve in the church. Other women in general in the church need to see you serve in the church. First, so that they are not carrying all the ministry on their backs. And second, so that they would not be tempted to venture into an area of service that is not reserved for them, but for men. And I'm going to quote one of my favorite pastors, complementarianism. Complementarianism is often caught before it is taught, and men are the ones who do the most to make complementarianism look like catching the flu or winning the lottery. So guys, let's not make the heartbeat of the message, women sit down, when it should be men stand up. Church, this is one of those topics that really sticks out for the life and the function of the church, of God's church today. And I know that our church's stance on it kind of sticks out like a sore thumb in our culture. And it seems like the more we talk about complementarianism, gender differentiation, gender roles, you know, the more controversial we seem to be getting. But this is important stuff. It is important, important stuff. Men and women of the church, I just ask that we seek to honor God among our gathering by keeping to his creative order. And let us seek, let us all seek to serve the Lord faithfully as the church and within the setting that he has ordained for us. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for another glorious day, and we are especially thankful today as we are gearing up for our, all of our fall ministry opportunities. And Father, it is my prayer that these ministries would have at the center of them the function of giving you glory, and that all those serving in these numerous roles would seek to honor and glorify you in their service. And Father, I thank you for instructing us Thank you for showing us in your word, your desire for how the church should function regarding men and women in service. And I'm thankful for your provision of servant-hearted men and women who have stepped up over the years in immeasurably indispensable ways. Lord, remind us to always stay within your creative design in the church. And finally, Father, let us just thank you for your son, the reason for our gathering our teaching, and our serving. We are members of his body, and we are each given gifts and abilities to best serve Jesus here. Help us to do so, and we pray this in your name. Amen.